book of Hebrews, I am, uh, I'm beginning a five-part series that will go through the month of July in some Sundays and some Wednesdays, and uh, it's going to be called, uh, based on uh, television, we call it On TV. It's going to be five. This morning, I'm going to be speaking on Game of Thrones, and then on Wednesday night, I'll be speaking on uh, House of Cards. And next Sunday, you just cannot miss next Sunday. Next Sunday, I'll be speaking on Naked and Afraid. <laughs> you have to be here for that. You know you can't miss Naked and Afraid. And uh, then there'll be some others uh, throughout this series. I hope that you'll be here for as many of those as possible. Today, however, I want to speak on Game of Thrones. Now, as I begin this morning, let me, let me say one thing. This is very, very important. <laughs> I have never seen one single episode of any of the TV shows I'm preaching on. So I'm not for them, I'm not against them, I'm not recommending them, they may all be blasphemous and horrible, all I'm dealing with are the titles. Because the titles, you just can't pass up titles like these, like Game of Thrones. If you, if you will, take your Bibles now and turn to the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter. The book of Hebrews. I want to begin reading with verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it men of old obtained a good report. By faith we understand that the universe was framed by the word of God, so that things that are, that are seen were, made, were not made out of things which are visible. Now if you will turn to verse uh, 11, therefore, by faith Sarah herself also received the ability to conceive seed. She bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man who was as good as dead sprang so many, a multitude as the stars of the sky and innumerable as the sand in the seashore. These all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them from afar, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Those who say such things declare plainly that they are looking for a homeland. And certainly, if they had been thinking of the country out of which they came, they might have had opportunity to return. But they desired a better country, that is to say, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, and he has prepared a city for them. Now, if you will, turn to Philippians, the third chapter, and the 20th verse. Philippians 3 and 20. Our citizenship. Now, listen to this verse. This is very powerful. Our citizenship is in heaven, from where also we await our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I just want you to let that verse roll around in your mind for a moment before we pray. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we await, coming from there, the king of our true country, not made with hands. Put your hands on your Bible and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for this morning. Lord, we thank you for the country that we live in. And I, I know, God, that there are people around the world right now joining us through the internet that are praying for the country in which they live. Lord, I pray that you will bless all the nations of the earth, that Jesus would be Lord over those nations. Free them from tyranny and bloodshed and violence. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray that her enemies will be silenced around about and that you will comfort her, be around her as the mountains are around about Jerusalem. But we are here, God. We are in this place. And we ask, Lord, that you will move upon our nation. Be the Lord over us as well, Lord. Forgive us of our sins nationally. But, oh, Lord, we pray, bless the republic. We believe you for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. I know that there are people watching all over the world. 
And sometimes they are a wee bit confused by the, by the mixture of patriotism and faith in the United States. But they must come to understand and see that historically, our nation was founded in an operation of faith. We are arguing now about what kind of country we're going to be. It's reaching the highest levels, and there are all kinds of decisions being made, some with which I agree and many with which I deeply disagree. Having said all that, the ground and foundation of the United States was always in faith that there is a living, eternal, immortal, almighty God who watches over the nations and on whose faith this nation rests. I know now that revisionist historians want to change all that, but whether it was the sort of uh, blunted deism of Thomas Jefferson or the deep spiritual faith of others. The founding fathers believed that they were resting this country up on the stone, the, 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 the unshakable stone of Judeo-Christian faith in a God who was the God over all the nations. That's where this country began. Now I have uh, just received uh, a list from the University of California system, the president of which is Janet Napolitano. And uh, it's a list of phrases that, which they say are not forbidden on the campuses, the various campuses of the University of California system. They're not forbidden, but they are recommended that faculty and staff no longer use these phrases because they might be offensive to somebody in some way or another. I'm not going to read the whole list to you, but I was deeply amused with one of them. And I would like to say, this, this is one of the phrases off of this list. There, there were all kinds. One was, uh, in the United States, if you work hard enough, you can achieve your goals. We're not supposed to use that anymore because that makes people feel like somehow or another they're not accomplishing or all kinds. Of, there are all kinds. But listen to this one. This is one we're not supposed to use anymore or that they are not supposed to use in the University of California system. America is the land of opportunity. We're not supposed to say that anymore. I don't even, I don't even know what they're trying to stop. I'm not even sure what they're opposed to. A land, America is no longer a land of opportunity. Now it, there's no opportunity. There's the opportunity to say stupid stuff like that. I'm glad that we live in a country where the people have the liberty to make inane, stupid statements just like that and without any punishment coming to them. Aren't you glad? I disagree with that, but I disagree with what they're saying. America is still the land of opportunity. Here is the proof that America is still the land of opportunity. The people that are trying to be here. They're not coming here from all over the world because there's no chance for them. They're not coming here because opportunities are limited, but because opportunities are unlimited. I do want to say to all those who criticize the United States, I'm not dealing with the immigration policy. I'm not, I'm not, that's not a battle I want to fight from this pulpit or anywhere else. I just want to say this to you. We're not building any fences to keep Americans in. We're not keeping people from escaping. There are countries right now where people are doing everything they can to flee poverty and violence and cruelty and all of those things. Where do they want to come? The land of opportunity. I believe also in a practical Christian patriotism. I, I, I reserve the right to criticize my country. I reserve the right to say those things which need to be said. And, and I won't back down from that. Amen. However, I also believe that we are enjoined by Scripture to pray for our leaders. That we are enjoined to put our Christianity into practical use to pray for the leadership of the country. Whether that is a king or a president or a Caesar or whoever it has been throughout the years, Christians were enjoined by Scripture, pray for those who are in authority over you. Secondly, I believe that we are called, it says, render unto Caesar those things which are Caesar's. Therefore, I believe that Christians ought to be the most diligent in paying their taxes. 
Christians ought to be the most diligent in voting. Christians ought to be the most diligent in understanding what the real realities of the political climate are and who exercise their right to vote and all rules and, uh, of citizenship. Christians ought to be the best citizens and the most patriotic members of any country in which they live. And we live in the United States. Now, what about practical Christian patriotism and when the country in which we live is immoral? What do, we, what do we do about that? There are really two kinds of immoral laws. The first is the kind of law that gives others, us as well, but we're simply not going to do it, the kind of law that gives others permission to live wickedly. In other words, it makes legal things that other people want to do. We don't agree with those things. They're not things we want to do, but we are not forced to do them. They simply allow other people to live as wickedly as they want to. Then there are, Im then there are immoral laws that force me to do wickedness. That's a different thing. I do not have to disobey the first one. I simply don't have to do those wicked things, which are now legal but which no longer speak to me. I don't have to do them. But, on the, but where a law forces me to do something that is wicked. In other words, take the example of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that the law said you must bow down before the golden statue of the king and worship. That's the law. The law doesn't simply give, didn't simply give other people the permission to worship a golden idol but it now required those Jewish boys to worship that idol. And they said, that law I won't obey. This is a distinction that American Christians need to keep in our minds, that there are those laws which allow others to do wickedly. I don't have to disobey them. What I simply do is obey the conscience and the and the truth that God has given me. I know what's right based on the word of God and I will live that way. But when it comes to that point where a law forces me to do wickedly, then that's a place where true Christian patriotism says, that law I will not obey. I don't know that it'll ever come to that in the United States. God forbid that it ever comes to that in the United States. But I know that we need to have our minds made up before we get there. We need to know who we are in Christ and who he is in us. The people of God have served him and followed him in all kinds of cultures, ruled over throughout history by all kinds of thrones. This, this title, Game of Thrones, really could be used as a kind of, it really sounds like a, a history book because really one could study history only from the standpoint of thrones of authority, worldly authority in opposition, trying to topple one another, conquer one another. There are all of these thrones throughout history that have tried to achieve either national or regional or global prominence. From Nimrod to Pharaoh and the Egyptians, from the Medio Persians, Cyrus, Artaxerxes, to Alexander of Greece and the Caesars of Rome, history is a game of thrones. The lust for power drives those who will kill, conquer, destroy, loot, do everything that it takes in order to place their throne over the thrones of others. In, in history can be seen as a game of thrones. This, this lust for power to control others can drive nations and, and cultures and, and kings and conquerors that they, they want to be in domination over someone else. Now, when we talk about the Game of Thrones nationally and internationally and globally, we, we can see that, that that is a constant theme of many conquering nations. It is also a challenge in, even in our own relationships. It, it can become that church can be a game of thrones. 
that inside, I've seen churches ripped asunder, torn to pieces because somebody in the church decides that they want their throne to be over this area, this area needs to be over that area, and you can just wind up with absolute war going on inside a church. When you, when you search through the annals of church splits and ruptures and divisions and, and all of that happens in church arguments, when you search through that, I promise you it will never, ever, ever be about anything that anybody tells you it was about. I've seen churches split over whether or not to sing out of hymn books or off of overhead projectors. And they don't realize that overhead projectors no longer even exist. The world has moved on, and they're fighting over stupid things, whether or not to pave the back parking lot, whether or not to raise the salary for the youth pastor, which they haven't raised since 1958. I've seen, I've seen churches rupture over the stupidest stuff, and I promise you, when you get right down to it, it was never, ever about what they were said they were fighting about. The real deal was whose throne is on high. Who's in charge? That's the real deal. It will always be about rebellion and internal warfare. I've seen the same thing true in families. When suddenly some teenager decides nobody's throne is going to rule over me. I will put my throne over my dad's. I'll put my throne over my mom's. And that teenager establishes himself as the rule in that family and begins to literally terrorize that family with conquest tactics causing anger and hurt and division and resentment, and the teenager actually becomes a rebellious throne inside the legitimate authority of that household. Now, having said that, it's easy for us as parents and grandparents to say, oh, those kids, oh, those kids, if they would just get down off of their high thrones and yield to us, everything would be okay. The problem with it is sometimes they have never seen the throne of their parents really administer with justice and grace. Dads, I need to say a word to you, and here it is. If you just want to sit on the high throne in your family and order people around and be the big shot in your family, you actually cause rebellion. You will actually lift up thrones against your throne. If you just want to be the domineering, loud guy banging your fist on the table and you think you can intimidate your wife and kids just by talking louder and being bigger than they are, then you're, you have assumed a throne of dominion and domination, not a throne of a servant leader. The same thing is true in all kinds of relationships. What we are called to as Christians is the ministry of servant leadership, where we say, yes, I'm in a position of authority. Yes, I am. I am your dad, and we're going to do this the best way I know how to do, but I'm making this decision because I know that it's right for you. I'm making this decision because I love you. I'm making this decision. This may even cost me. This may even cost me as the, as the leader, but I'm making the right decision and not going to sit up on the throne as the big king. Everybody down, worship me, or I'll melt you like wax. <laughs> the servant leader lifts his people up. The servant leader cares for their needs. The servant leader is sacrificed for them. If there is a great need in the United States today, I believe it is in the local family, in churches, in organizations, and in government at every level for a renaissance of servant leadership, for leaders that say, I will do what's right for the country as God views it. How do we live? How do we live? in a culture that is adversarial. How, how did the Jewish people live under the, the domination of Rome? How did Christians live in the first century in Rome? How, how do we exist in these things? First of all, we exist by knowing that every throne that is placed over us is temporary. Think back over history. The most powerful man in the whole world at the time that he ruled was the Pharaoh, Tutmos the Great. Where is he now? Where are all the Egyptian pharaohs? Where is Artaxerxes? Where is Cyrus the Great? Alexander the Great. Nobody even knows where his bones are. 
What about the Caesars? Where's Julius Caesar? Where are Caesar Augustus? Where are they all? Where are the conquerors? Where is Hitler? Where is Mussolini? Where is Mao? Where is Stalin? Where are all of them? Gone every single one. Every throne of dominion and power in the natural order is temporary. And we rest ourselves on that one great truth. <laughs> Secondly, we, we say to ourselves, I will live a faithful and holy life inside this culture. If everyone else in this country goes completely insane, I will still serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I, I, I love my country. I'm an American. I'm a red, white, and blue American. I'm the I'm the child of a veteran. I, I love the nation. I, I weep when the Boy Scouts march in with the flags. I, I'm an American, and I'm a patriot. I do not fool myself about my country. We have a mixed history. We have not been a perfect country, and we are not a perfect country today. Anyone that says that is mistaken, and they are doing their own brand of revisionist history. We are not a perfect country. We do not have a perfect past. We do not have a perfect president, and we do not have perfect leaders. We do not have a perfect Congress. We do not have perfect judges. <laughs> Having said all that, I refuse to abandon the nation in which I live to my own prayerlessness. I will continue to pray for my leaders. I will continue to serve loyally. There are going to be people ahead for us that take advantage of the change in thrones to live wickedly beyond anything that we in our childhood ever dared to think of or imagine. How shall we then live? If we are reduced to anger and hatred and bitterness, then I believe that we will not be able to have the effect in this country that we ought to have. There has been a time in the country when it kind of, we kind of had a cultural, a cultural holiday, when actually it was easy to be a Christian in the United States. It was expected to be a Christian in the United States. I'm not talking about maybe the kind of dynamic, born-again, spirit-filled Christian, but it would have been very difficult in this country for, for, for many, many decades, very difficult for someone who was an outspoken atheist to be elected to anything. It's going to become more and more difficult for Christians. I'm, I'm neither a prophet nor the child of a prophet, but I can see which way the wind's blowing. So can you. Things are going to be difficult in the days ahead and the years ahead and the decades ahead if Jesus tarries. But what I do know is this, if we, we may be called of God to live in dark times, we are not called to be dark Christians. And the Bible said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify God. It didn't say just let your light shine before righteous men. It said, let your light shine before all people. I believe in my country. I love my country, and I'm going to continue to love my country. But I can look at her dark places historically, national sins for which even today we still pay a price. I'm not saying we've been perfect in all of our wars or perfect in all of our history, and we are not perfect in our present. What I do know is this. As I gaze across the community of nations, we are still the land of opportunity. I believe that. The third thing is this. Over all of the various thrones, and, and I'm not just talking about political thrones, the throne of technology, the, the throne of, of political concept, the, the throne of culture, over all of these thrones, the one great truth that we know is that he who sits on the throne will be the ultimate judge of all nations. All nations. <laughs> Ours as well. I cherish the founding fathers. One of my great heroes is George Washington. I don't know why we can't stand for George Washington to be what he was, 
a great heroic national figure, our founding father, our, our leader in the war of independence and our first president. Why can't we live? Why do we all have to talk about the fact that he had wooden false teeth? Why is that the big thing? George Washington, well, he may have been great, but he had wooden teeth. You know what I say to that? I say, if you can be a great man, a great general, a great president, and a founding father with wooden teeth, that makes you even higher, in my opinion. Why do we have to bring down our founding fathers and point to all of their shortcomings and all of the, because when we look at them as the great heroic God-fearing leaders that they were, it can make us feel smaller about who we are. So we drag them down so that we don't have to feel intimidated. When I know, I know that they weren't perfect because no man is perfect save Jesus only. I know they weren't perfect. What I do know is they founded a nation which still stands out among the darkness of the nations as a light to the world. I still believe in America, despite the weaknesses of all of his founders. But when we come to the end of all things, when all nations are brought before God, when all nations are, are paraded before him and the judgment occurs, when we come to that, we must understand that he makes and unmakes kings. He pulls down nations. He wipes away the countries of the world with his fingertips. And when he sits upon the throne to judge us, I love George Washington, but it won't be George Washington on the throne. George Washington lived and died for this country, but he did not die for my soul. The king of all kings and lord of all lords and the master upon the throne is not going to be George Washington or Thomas Jefferson or any of the great founders. We celebrate them. We rejoice in their memory and what they accomplished in this country constitutionally, which it would be good if we would read every now and again. But just we rejoice in that. We rejoice in that. But, it, but Thomas Jefferson will not be upon the throne. I can say this too. It will not be Muhammad nor any of those who still wield his bloody sword. It will not be Muhammad on that throne. It will not be Baha'i, will not be Buddha, it will not be Scientology. It won't be Joseph Smith on the throne. It will be Christ and him alone. Every knee, every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess. Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Every knee. We must remember, we must remember, God will judge every nation. America, ni neither will America escape judgment. God will judge all. But we also must know that when all of those thrones are passed away, what remains is the ground and foundation of our eternity. Not just our nation, but we have found life and that more abundant in him. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the King of Kings. Let me, let me read to you. If you haven't, will you allow me just to read something to you? I know it can be boring to hear someone read, but I, I want to read something to you. If you haven't read it in a while, I'd like, if you will, to let me read to you from the book of Revelation, the fourth chapter. Now just kind of listen, if you will. After this I looked, and there was an open door in heaven. The first voice I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and there was a throne set in heaven, with one sitting upon the throne. And he who sat there appeared like a jasper and a sardius stone. There was a rainbow around the throne, appearing like an emerald, Twenty-four thrones were around the throne, and I saw twenty-four elders sitting upon those thrones, clothed in white garments. They had crowns of gold in their, on their heads. Lightnings and thunder and voices proceeded from the throne. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are, in the, seven, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne was a sea of glass, like crystal. 
In the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures covered with eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second living creature was like a calf. The third living creature had the face of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures had six wings each and they were covered with eyes all around all day and night without ceasing. They were saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. Then they cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. When all of the Game of Thrones, the ridiculous games of power and domination that we play in this present world are all swept away, and everything that is seen is burned up, what will remain is the throne of thrones, and on that throne will be the Lord God Almighty. Let's stand up and worship the Lord. Let's worship the Lord. Come on. But listen to this. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now listen. We can confess it now by faith and receive him as our Savior and the Lord and establish his throne over our lives. Or we can climb up on our own throne and say, I'm the Lord of my life. I rule my own life. In which case, at the end of things, it will be an unhappy experience when we are forced to our knees and forced to confess him. I want to do it now. I want to do it now by faith, and I want to do it with joy. I want to confess him now. I want to bend my knee before his throne now by faith. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes all over the room, if you will, please. Every person. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this moment. I thank you that you're up on the throne. Lord, all the games that we play, all the games of thrones, when really the whole thing comes down to Jesus is Lord of my life. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, if you'd say, Dr. Mark, will you please pray for me? Please pray. I don't want to come to that terrible moment when every knee is forced to bow, every tongue is forced to confess. I want to do that now. I want to bow my knee now. I want to confess him as Lord of my life now. And I've never really done that. I need to get that settled right here, right now, in this place of faith. I want to get that settled. I want him to be upon the throne of my life. If that's you, I want you to lift your hand up right where you are and then take it right back down. Say, I need to settle this. Yes, yes, all right, right back there and over there. Hold your hand up high. Say, I want to get this settled right now. Now, all over the room, if you will, just pray with me right out loud. Heavenly Father, I open my heart. I want to come down from the throne. I don't want to be the ruler of my own life. I want you to be the ruler of my life. Lord Jesus, ascend to the throne of my heart. Rule over me from this moment on as never before. I plead your blood for the forgiveness of my sins. And I'm believing you from this moment that I'm off of the throne and you're on the throne. Lord of my life, and I celebrate you.